Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome to Europa Universalis 4 with the Cradle of Civilization DLC. Today I'll be going over all of the mechanics and the notes from the development diaries over just what has changed in the Cradle of Civilization DLC. This is a very, very large update. This is a very lengthy update and as such will be a decently lengthy video. There will be timestamps in the description of the video down below as well as in the comment section so that way you can kind of pick and choose what you want to do. I'm very excited about this DLC and I'm very thankful that Paradox has allowed me early access. Uh, the game is uh, very much going to get shaken up, especially in the Middle East region but it can definitely have influence across the entire globe without further ado let's go ahead and dive right on in first and foremost probably one of the biggest changes in the dlc is the breakup of countries whereas you have a lot of different countries in it before the release they felt it was more historically accurate to break these up even further which would allow you to start as a lot of smaller countries in the region, but then be able to consolidate enough to form the bigger regions that we've seen in previous patches. For instance, Yemen is now broken up into Aden, Rasids, Hadramat, Mahra, Miklof, and Nijran. The Hejaz in Central Arabia now has Medima and Dawasir. Eastern Arabia brings in Jas. Egypt and Northern Arabia bring in uh, Aniza and Fadl, and that's just in the southern regions. You have the southern Caucasus and the lands of the black and white sheep, which introduce uh, Bitlis, Hassin Kaffa, Karabakh, and Adrabal. These are also, these are vassals of Kara Konyonlu, or at least uh, Bitlis and Karabakh, and then a couple of some uh, independent emirates and sheikdoms, so really shaking up the diplomatic scene there. In Georgia, Shirvan and Circassia, we have Samska, which is an independent principality. We have Emireti, another independent kingdom, and Avaria, the vassal of Gazik Muk. And then in the Ottomans and Turkish Beylix has been reformed a little bit as well. Rum can now be formed by Turkish Beylik. Any by a Turkish Beylik that is not the Ottomans and has been able to claim certain provinces as well as eliminated the Ottomans. So again, it's kind of giving more power, more historical accuracy to the regions of this area and allowing you to consolidate and potentially have a greater chance of overthrowing these bigger nations. And last but not least in terms of the region breakup is the Timurid Empire. This is definitely a region that I've seen a lot of people play as because you deal with a lot of civil war. But as such, we, we see a lot of um, vassals being broken up within the Timurid uh, dynasty. They are kind of the governors of the region. And what's really cool is they now have a couple of new decisions under the Timurid Empire. They do start as an empire at the beginning of the game, and they have been improved to hopefully not just constantly be enveloped in its own civil war. The new decisions include claim Timur's legacy. Countries ruled by the Timurid rulers can form the Timurid Empire, gaining or getting permanent claims on all of Timur's conquests, new national ideas, and an empire rank. And then we can also do enthrone the Timurid prince, in the early game, a powerful independent country in this region invites a Timurid claimant to rule it, enabling the decision. In western Iran, we have Iraq and Najam. This breaks up these countries into Ajam, Mazandran, Bayapus, and Gilan. A lot of these just really shaking up the political region. Fars in southern Iraq has been broken up amongst the southern Iraqis. Uh, Mashada, Fars, and Luristan, Khorasan, and Transonia. Transoxiana, excuse me, is also broken up. This is more getting closer and closer into uh, India. We now have Sistan, Transoxiana, uh, Afghanistan, and Khorasan. Uh, and so just really just breaking everything up. This adds somewhere around upwards of two dozen, I think, uh, close to it, two dozen new countries in the region. So again, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to actually add some really good strategies if you want to play as one of these Middle Eastern nations. Super, super exciting. We also have a few new trade goods introduced. Uh, we have gems, which gives a local bonus tax modifier of 15%, a strategic bonus of a yearly inflation reduction of 0.05, which is actually pretty intense. It's represented in all forms of precious stone, but pearls and some of the more important sources um, of such as jade, calories, and even amber. 
And then one of the most famous sources of this precious stone in the world was uh, the diamond mines of Golconda. And these fabled mines are now represented by a strong bonus to goods produced in the Golconda province, giving you an incentive to take that as these new, pa as these new countries. Paper is now a new trade. Good local bonus, state maintenance minus 10, and a strategic bonus, administrative tech cost of minus 5%. It's a necessity for all types of advanced counting, which gives you that administrative tech bonus. And there are no provinces with local modifiers for paper production at the start, but some might appear during the game, depending on how the game plays out. We have glass, which gives a local production efficiency of plus 10%, and a strategic bonus of a diplomatic tech cost of minus 5%. Uh, and glass making at this time was still very much in its infancy and only at a start a few provinces knew how to produce it. Now, some exist in Anatolia and India as well. In time, glass would become an important trade good, not only as a luxury product, but due to the development of optics. And to show the importance of Venetian glass, the existing Murano glass industry modifier has been changed to a permanent province modifier that increases the glass production of the island of Venice, which is pretty sweet. Incense gives a local bonus of a trade value modifier plus 10% and a strategic bonus tolerance of the true faith 0.5%. This trade good represented things that burn to create smoke and fragrance such as frankincense, agarwood, sandalwood, myrrh, and other commodities to confound mainly in Arabia, East Africa, and Asia. And last but not least, livestock, which gives a supply limit modifier of plus 50% in the local area and a strategic bonus of a calf cost of minus 10%. Many provinces do not export the more refined products we cover. Uh, livestock will take place; they take the place of grain and wool in many parts of the world. It provides a more fitting trade good for some regions dominated by a pastoralist, as well as agricultural regions that did not specify in grain and cereal. So again, adding some new things, especially the livestock, because grain and wool are everywhere. And so adding this new feature will uh, allow some diverse actions and more strategic developments. A new mechanic in the game that I'm about to bring to light is something that is really, really awesome. I feel like they really brought it over from Hoi 4, Hearts of Iron 4, but it is something uh, called army drilling. So currently in the game, if you aren't fighting and you want to save some money, you just slam that military maintenance bar down as low as you can go, completely wrecks the morale, and if it gets attacked by that, then uh, you're pretty much screwed. However, now with the addition of army drilling, you can pay to have your armies trained so when it comes to times of war you can smack down the the opposing troops with a more efficient force any army with a leader can do the army drilling during which the morale will be lowered and also each non-mercenary unit will gain a drill value the drill mechanic does not affect mercenaries at all that is something to note this value will directly correspond to better performance in battle when not drilling, a unit's drill will degrade over time and will suffer if the unit is damaged and must reinforce. Scaling up to 100, army drill gives plus 10% shock damage, plus 10% fire damage, and then minus 10% shock damage received, and minus 10% fire damage received. Not only that, but drilling, since it requires a leader, your leader will also find themselves improving, gaining additional pips, doesn't say at what rate so all is not lost for your super super crappy general you roll and the likelihood depends on how much of your army are drilling and relative to your force limit so this is an actually a really big game changer because it's going to give you the incentive where if you can afford it you're going to want to drill now drill drilling regardless of your army maintenance bar when you are drilling the units within that are at their full limit so you are paying full price for them, even though they are just in a drilling stance. But that is going to give you a huge incentive. I mean, you could have plus 100% shock damage, fire damage, shock damage received, minus 100%, and minus 100% fire damage, I believe, if I am reading that correctly. And then, of course, if you have a lot of troops drilling, that general is going to level up and get better and better and better. So it really gives you an incentive in times of peace to bring your crappy generals and put them in an army that is drilling so that way he can level up. So in times of war, instead of having a crappy 0010 general, you potentially could have a 2233 general that is much, much stronger than he was before the last war. Really gives you an awesome incentive to, to keep your armies in tight fit formation, especially because you can lose that army drill when you are not drilling.
So along with army drilling, we now have an army professionalism level. So you get your army drilled, ready to rumble. It has an amazing, it's at 100. It has a huge buff to both the damage it inflicts as well as the damage it receives. But you now have an army professionalism level. It's a national value measuring how closely your army models a modern standard army versus heavy reliance on mercenaries. So this is very, very interesting because the more professional your army becomes, the less effective mercenaries are, which makes sense in the beginning when your armies aren't that great, hiring mercenaries who are very professional units are going to be the way to go if you can afford it. However, as your professionalism grows, mercenaries become less and less necessary, and especially when I come to the levels of uh, professionalism and their effects. Your professional level is increased by drilling your armies, which equals plus one per year if 100% force limit is uh, drills to scale. Constructing military buildings such as barracks or regimental camps gives plus 0.5 per tier, and recruiting generals gives you plus 1 per general. Uh, so you can build up to your 100 level through these ways as well as through events, things of that nature. Conversely, professionalism is decreased by destroying military buildings. If you destroy barracks or regimental camps, it gives you minus 1 per tier of building. And then if you recruit mercenaries, it gives you minus 0.25 per unit, which is huge. That is a very, very big hit. Uh, I mean, four, you got to think, if you build 10 mercenary units, your professionalism decreases by 2.5. That's a pretty big hit. Professionalism has the following effect scaling up from 0 to 100. Shock damage plus 10%, fire damage and plus 10%, and movement speed plus 20%. Low professionalism grants bonuses for the recruitment of mercenaries. Starting from zero and scaling down to nothing at 50% professionalism, mercenary costs decrease and your available mercenaries, uh, your mercenary cost decreases by 15% and available mercenaries increase by 15%. So obviously, as I just mentioned, the lower your professionalism level is, the more incentives you have to hire mercenaries. The higher your professionalism becomes, the more incentives you have to disband those mercenaries and you can use them that way. All nations start the game with low to no professionalism. You have events, you have decisions, you have modifiers that can affect the values positively and negatively from standardizing your uniforms, which was uh, an event that already occurs, to deciding how extensively to elute fallen cities. The value of your army professionalism unlocks new interface looks and new abilities at every 20 points. So at 0 to 19 professionalism, you have a tattered look to your units. They're just not that good looking. As they gain more and more professionalism, they start looking better and better, which I think is a really, really cool UI decision and just really brings that, that mechanic to light very easily. You should be able to tell what the professionalism of an army is just by how they look on the map and that brings some new strategic advantages to it as well. What abilities are gained for each 20 professionalism? As I mentioned before, there are different tiers and they provide some pretty good benefits. At level 20, you get a supply depot, which is an ability accessible in the revisited unit view, which establishes a depot in a province. Friendly supply in that entire area is increased by 50%. If it's lost, if the province is occupied, the depot will be destroyed or otherwise it lasts there for two years. At 40 professionalism, you get the refill garrison ability, which allows your army to take some of its manpower and restore the garrison of a fort instantly. So if you just take a uh, fort, but you got to move your army elsewhere, but you really need that fort in that area, you can use that army to refill the garrison, which is really, really cool. Disbanded units at level 60 uh, are returned to the manpower pool. So normally, if you disband 20,000 troops from an army because you just can't afford them, you lose 20,000 manpower. You don't get any of that army back. But at a 60 uh, level professionalism, those disbanded units are brought back to the man pool in full strength. This alone gives you a huge incentive to bring your professionalism up to at least that level to allow you to be able to funnel that back in. That gives you really good incentives during wars to be more strategic about where you want to place your manpower and really helps you fill your manpower quicker, especially in times of peace. At level 80, military generals cost half price to recruit, which is really, really cool. Uh, and so they cost 25 military power rather than the standard 50. And then at 100% professionalism, your reserves take 50% less morale damage. 
So they normally take passive morale damage in large ongoing battles, will now take far less, and can really turn the tide in a battle. The only caveat to this is, of course, once they implement this, once everyone's playing it, they're going to monitor it closely. And so these, these stats could potentially change depending on how testing and balancing and development continues further. So these both army drilling and army professionalism, I think are really going to change the game because this is a worldwide effect. It's really going to give you an incentive to both drill, to spend money on drilling, as well as figure out how to get your professionalism up and can give you a huge, huge advantage over, over other lesser countries and lesser armies uh, to, to really be able to conquer very well. Trade policies are also effective. We now have some new things that we can do. You will be able to set trade policies in any node where your nation has a merchant present. There is no cost to setting the policy and can be changed once every 12 months. The uh, policies are maximize profits, which gives you plus five trade power, which is the default policy once you send a merchant into there. Hostile trading gives you plus 25% spy network speed in nations with the merchant present or the home node. You can establish communities, which gives plus 15 improvement relations with all other nations within their home node or merchant present located there. And the last but not least, improve inland routes. This one is my favorite and probably what I will do if I can remember is plus one combat terrain bonus in trade node provinces, which is only possible with 33% of the trade power in a node. That's actually pretty intense. And uh, of course, these four affect all the nations. Uh, these, uh, there's one that is specific to the Islamic Muslim nations though. And this is pretty cool. You have a propagate religion. So once your merchant is in a node and controls 33% of the trade power, they are able to activate the propagate religion trade policy, which will establish a religious center in the node, spreading the religion within the node. And it's a really, really cool way as a Muslim nation to spread your influence outward very, very quickly. If you can establish a trade node um, in Europe, you can spread Islam into Europe very quickly. If you establish a trade node over in Indonesia or over in Asia, I can very much see how you could very quickly turn all of those nations to, uh, to Islam. A really, really cool uh, factor, and I'm glad that they specialized a kind of, uh, since this is the Cradle of Civilization DLC, really gave the Muslim nations an incentive to get into that trade node as well. On the topic of religion in the Cradle of Civ Civilization uh, DLC, we now have two new factors that are accompanying the piety bar as well as the Islamic schools of thought. To begin, we'll look at the piety bar. So now it has, as a mechanic in the past, hasn't really done much as we've seen with other nations uh, such as the Greek Orthodox. You have kind of edicts that you can do which affect your piety and um, not really, I mean, it's been good, but it hasn't been completely fleshed out, super engaging. Uh, they've spruced up the piety bar, having instead of just low piety or high piety, um, low piety is now called mysticism, and high piety is being depicted as legalism. And now your piety events have been rewritten, rewritten to reflect those, so you will have you'll be either a mystic ruler or legalistic ruler, mm, rather than just measuring how pious you are, quote unquote. And uh, they've also weeded out some. Uh, some uh, opportunities to weed out some of the older events uh, as for instance book burning no longer is a pious action which I thought was pretty cool additionally uh, the expansion owners uh, our piety bonus can be passed up in favor of one-off effects depending on your pious leanings at Maya 75 piety or lower which is mysticism you can call on religious followers to bolster your manpower which gives you two years of manpower growth at one time and at 75 or greater piety, which is more towards the legalism, you are able to enforce the faithful adherence for an immediate loss of two corruption. So if you're expanding quickly, that would definitely be a way to counteract that. Or if you just have rampant corruption, you want to become more quote unquote pious uh, in order to handle that. The actions will push your piety back towards the center by 50. So if you were at uh, 75 piety, it would knock it back to 25. If you were at minus 75 piety, it would knock you back to minus 25 it gives you a good incentive is it worth uh the immediate incentives are they worth the long-term effects that you will get from being more in the middle of the line 
Additionally, each Islamic nation will follow one Muslim school of law. I said thought earlier, I did mean law. Uh, the school that your nation adheres to is predetermined. It cannot be changed. And for new nations or convert nations, it's chosen at your spotting and your conversion. Uh, each school grants its own bonus and has a relationship with each other school, ranging between respect, ambivalent, and hate. Ambivalence, being the middle ground, really grants you no effect, but nations from schools with mutual respect or hatred will find relations and diplomatic acceptance strengthened or lessened respectively. The relationship between schools are harmed by large-scale and prolonged wars between larger nations of those schools and conversely can be improved by long-standing trusted alliances between them. The Sunni school of law gets uh, technology costs of minus 0.05, so you get a little bit of a buff there. The Hanbali school gives an A impact of minus 0.1. The Maliki school gives development costs of minus 0.1. The Shafi school gives you an extra merchant. The Shia school uh, gives you a horde unity plus one, legitimacy plus one, Republican traditions 0.5, and a devotion of plus one. A very good incentive to kind of choose a Shia's religion uh, <laughs> school of law. The Jafari school gives you shock damage a 0.1 increase. And the Ziadi school gives you a shock damage reduction of point one so those are going to be your um your schools of law and not only that while your school that you uh that you have is set in stone you can invite scholars from other schools assuming an alliance and high relations with another nation you'll be able to spend 50 admin points and to invite a scholar who will give you an extra effect in addition to your own schools for 20 years that's not mentioned in the notes but it is something to note because it gives you an incentive to potentially ally yourself with some larger schools or even some smaller countries that have some good schools of thought that maybe you can vassalize etc etc inviting a school from an opposing faith school such as a sunni nation trying to invite a Saudi scholar will require lower piety although the Ibidus are exempt from this. So this is a really cool feature, both the piety uh, levels and the school of law. It is uh, about time that something that I know is sorely missing is just kind of piety effects. Now you get effects throughout the campaign for low or high piety, but I, do, I did love the Russian DLC because that allowed you to at least issue edicts to do something with that piety, and that's definitely a good incentive to either increase or decrease your piety, as well as interact with other sects of Islam uh, within that and your schools of law. Next up, we are looking at two uh, Muslim nations, prominent ones who shaped uh, the Middle Eastern history in the 15th century, and the white sheep and black sheep Turkmen of Ak Koyunlu and Kara Koyunlu. Of course, if I um, mispronounce those, I do apologize. And while these guys were uh, haphazardly named as steppe nomads, they have been now given their own special government type of a tribal confederation, complete with their own mechanics centered around tribal allegiance. On its own, the tribal confederation government grants minus five years of separatism, minus 10% war score costs for provinces, and plus 25% cavalry to infantry ratio. The rise and fall of these nations will ride on how well they're able to win over the tribal warriors of the region, and basically by winning battles and humiliating rivals, a tribal federation is able to increase their tribal allegiance, which will in turn grant stronger bonuses for the country. And then, of course, if you lose battles and you get humiliated, you can definitely lose that. Tribal allegiance grants no bonuses at zero, but at 30, but up to 30% manpower recovery and minus three national unrest as it grows. It will degrade uh, over time relative to your development score. And additionally, it can be spent to gain immediate insistence uh, uh, these effects cost 30 allegiance each and you can enlist a general which gains you a general of 40 tradition you can train horsemanship which means you get plus 15 percent cav combat ability for 10 years or a cons conscript from the tribes you can start production of six cav units in the capital at a 25 percent build time the inland tribes of arabia also share the mechanics while across the world the other tribal countries are either tribal despotisms or monarchies working as before uh, the black sheep and white sheep turkmen get national ideas i'm not going to go through those but they are pretty decent uh, in size and scope 
And now the national ideas for both of these countries and the tribal federation government are free changes with the 1.23 update, meaning you do not need the Cradle of Civilization DLC, but the tribal allegiance and its interactions therein are part of the expansion. And then another thing that will be of interest to the, to the entire region of Turkey and over into Iraq uh, is a change they've done for the Turkish behemoth, aka the Ottomans. Uh, in 1444, they have removed all foreign Anatolian cores for the Ottomans. Kandar, Karaman, Ramazan, Dulkadir, and Ak Koyunlu uh, can very much breathe a collective sigh that the Ottomans don't automatically get all of the cores to, you know, upwards of four countries without having to do any sort of spy network costs. So definitely will we'll increase uh, the difficulty for the Ottomans because they can't just troll over, you know, three plus countries right at the beginning of the game. Next up on the list is affecting the Persian Empire, or at least what you can do to create the Persian Empire. Uh, they've given quite the overhaul to the Persian region, and they want to take a closer look at what has changed. Uh, it's a very tricky time for the Turkmen Empire. Azam is considered an independent nation, and the vassals Tan, Soxiana, Sistan, Khorasan, Fars, and Afghanistan are very much chafing under the rule of the old and sickly Shah, Shah Rukh. As he lives, there's a great reduction to the liberty desire of these vassals, but when he dies, the Turkmen Empire is likely to fall into a long and costly civil war, as we see with almost every single game that I played of EU4, and now they've had some changes in the region to model this. I'm not going to go over the national ideas of these nations, simply uh, quote them and uh, shout them out. Uh, Azam, which is now an independent nation, has some new ideals. We have Fars, which is a vassal of the Timurids, Khorasan, a vassal of the Timurids, Transoxiana, which is a vassal of the Timurids, Timurids, excuse me, Afghanistan is a vassal of the Timurids, and Sistan is also a vassal. So you have, you know, a good handful of vassals to uh, take a hold of. Not only that, though, in the borderlands between the crumbling Timurid Empire and the Kara Konyunlu, a number of small sheikdoms are nominal vassals of both powers. In practice, many of them are independent in all but name. So something interesting here, um, in 1444, the, ro the rulers of Ardabil are under the influence of a growing Islamic sect, the Savavid Order. Historically, Ardabil is the embryo of the future Persian Empire and the Savavid Dynasty. And as such, Ardabil has a new government form, feudal theocracy, which it shares with a few other nations. Feudal Theocracy gives you plus one missionary for the Kingdom and Empire rank. You get missionary strength of plus one, and you get a tolerance of the true faith plus one, plus two at the Empire rank. Um, the Theocracy, the Feudal Theocracy, functions as a monarchy, but with a heavy religious focus. It can be adopted by any nation who forms Persia. And while this is a free change with the Persia update, the accompanying expansion will allow the use of government interactions made available for the feudal theocracies. These interactions has its own cost in a five year cooldown for 50 admin. You can seize clerical holdings, which gives you minus 15% build costs for five years. For 50 Diplo, you can invite minorities from abroad, gain minus 20% development costs and plus one random development in your capital area. And then for 50 military, you can sanction a holy war, which grants a claim on all non allied, non owned subjects bordering provinces which are owned by a nation who is not the feudal theocracy state religion. That's a really confusing sentence, but basically any province that is not under that feudal theocracy that you could go to war with, barring an alliance, you now have a claim on, which is pretty cool. Uh, so overall, the Persian Empire really gets some bolstered uh, help in order to form it, which is always pretty cool. I love seeing Persia in any of my EU4 plays, and I've always wanted to do it. I'm very excited to see if I can do it now with the update. On the subject of the Ottomans, uh, they've been giving a couple of buffs. We'll get to that in a second. But one of the key features uh, is that uh, an introduced government type is a strong boon to the Ottoman nation, but as the state of Persia uh, for the Persian update, it will be attainable for other nations, too, via the decision to restore the Sultanate of Rum. Basically, any ambitious Turkish nation can, after successfully wiping out the Ottomans and Byzantium, and along with conquering some provinces, will be able to form the uh, nation of Rum. 
they will grant a new nation name, a flag, new color, and national ideas for the Sultanate of Rum. And while um, this does give quite a few buffs, I'm not going to give any of the national ideas out. You can read those in the patch notes yourself. And so with uh, the government, the Ottoman government type available and attainable, we also have some new toys for them to play with. The Ottoman government gets access to Pashas and Janissaries. Pashas, what they will do, uh, this reduces unrest and the state maintenance costs for those provinces uh, that you have a Pasha in, while also raising the cost of new buildings and units from them. Which basically means if you have some far away provinces from the capital that are giving you some trouble, you can put a Pasha in there. It will reduce the state maintenance, much like the autonomy does, while also reducing unrest. But revoking a Pasha will result in an increased unrest for 10 years. And then Janissaries uh, have seen a lot of changes. They're not a countrywide boon for every unit. They're not unlockable unit like they used to be. They are now considered an elite unit. They can be recruited for a set cost of 50 military power from any given state. And for every 10 development of a heathen faith state, heathen faith land in a state, one Janissary will be spawned, which means these you want to emphasize, A, not uh, destroying everything, not converting everybody, but also making high development concentrations of a wrong religion land. So if you have something that is Greek Orthodox that's closer to Hungary or something of that nature, You'll want to pump development into that, any extra points that you have while your research uh, can to handle it. And that way, if you need to, if you have something that has, you know, one or 200 development in it, then I know that's crazy, but you could, you know, spawn 10 or 20 of them right off the bat, which gives you some pretty good buffs. These special units cost twice as much to reinforce, but are able to withstand damage, taking 10% less shock and fire damage. In battle and the Janissary decadence disaster has been altered now to fire if a nation relies too heavily on Janissaries relative to their force limit. Overall it's a pretty good update being able to take over the Ottomans especially since the Ottomans don't have that uh, core over all of Anatolia really gives you the incentive and the possibility to take over as the Ottomans and then of course you have those two buffs as the Janissaries and the Pashas really giving you some some potential unrest capabilities as well as the ability to get some pretty elite units that you can field in battle. Now on to the cultures and religious section of the update. Uh, rulers, advisors, heirs, and consorts all now have an established culture and a religion that is takes a part of their, uh, their demeanor and their personality. Uh, it'll be immediately visible, especially for the advisors. You will be able to immediately see what religion and culture they are, um, and a star indicating if their culture is a primary, promoted, or otherwise culture, which is pretty cool. And it will have, apparently have some effects. Rulers, heirs, and consort cultures and religions will be visible in their tooltips, and will primarily be that of their nation, but there are events, both new and revisited, to spawn certain peoples and show interactions between various faiths and cultures in your court. Uh, and, and, and especially in terms of the cultures and religious, especially in switching and needing to know what does what, uh, the Mamluks now have a unique government type, the Mamluk government, uh, where the ruling class's culture is of great importance. The Mamluks don't get heirs or consorts, but they always get a new sultan on the monarch's death. And the nation will decide if it would like to be governed by a sultan from their own culture's lands or take a slave ruler from further afield. And historically, they will be able to bring in Circassian uh, rulers who are seen to have high legitimacy over ruling the nation. But you can elect to choose a ruler from lands of other cultures. And while these sultans have a lower legitimacy, Scaling with the amount of your culture's lands they have, they will have another advantage in using cultural interactions. Each year, the Mamluk government will gain uh, three plus rulers to uh, the admin, diplo, or military stat for each of their cultural interactions, which can be used as follow. Admin actions promotes the ruler's culture and government, which minus 5% uh, to all power costs for one year. Uh, diplo actions set off, uh, sell off the uh, ruler culture's slaves, in which case you would gain the development of the ruler's culture plus two uh, during the current, current age. And you also get ducats, apparently. Gain ducats, there we go. Uh, and then a military action you recruit from the ruler culture's lands, in which case you would gain manpower. 
Uh, so while a homegrown sultan may start with low legitimacy, you may prefer them over a more stable alternative to get more out of your interactions. That's definitely an interesting strategy to go. And then spreading and conquering certain cultures may be of more interest to the Mamluks now, considering they want to get perhaps a ruler of a certain culture every time. And additionally, the Mamluk government itself will give plus two to all sultans admin stats and allow extra cultures to be promoted depending on the government rank of the nation. Promoting cultures is 50% cheaper for a nation with the Mamluk government. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the Mamluks aren't the only nation to get the Mamluk government. Uh, any Ikta nation who holds Cairo uh, can adopt the government for themselves. So that's something that's pretty interesting. Uh, for instance, an Inca nation uh, will have the incentive to have subjects by way of their taxation policies. Every 20 years, an Inca nation can set their taxation policies to gain a lump sum of resources depending on their subjects' development and a modifier on the nation for the duration of the policy. For instance, you have efficient tax farming, which gives you plus 50% national tax modifier and two total subject development ducats. Land acquisition gives you minus 5% core creation costs and plus 50 total subject development manpower. And then lenient taxation gives you minus 50% subject liberty desire, but plus one diplomatic reputation. Uh, definitely, definitely um, shakes up the Ma uh, Mamluk government and gives you some pretty cool buffs, as well as just some interesting government incentives. The only other thing that is interesting to, mission, uh, to mention is that missionaries in your country are now able to go to your subjects' lands and convert the religion they're in, which is a really cool factor. It's something that I've noticed of late whenever I get a subject of a different religion, which can happen. Uh, it just causes some um, a little bit of awkwardness. So being able to send your missionaries into your subjects' lands is a pretty, pretty cool uh, factor and will come in with the update. And that is it. Uh, we have some military tidbits, AI updates, um, some modding things, some startup uh, new things, as well as achievements. But I'm not really going to go into those because those aren't so entirely crucial to the the patch itself that I want to mention. I mainly wanted to go over all of the new mechanics and everything therein. So guys, I really, really hope that you enjoyed this overview. It is quite lengthy, but I mean, there's, there's upwards of 12 sections that I have gone over and there's actually 15 sections uh, within that so definitely it could dive into it and you will spend a good amount of time reading it if you enjoyed this overview give it a thumbs up haven't already hit that subscribe button follow me on twitch twitter facebook and instagram i hope you will enjoy europa universalis for the cradle of civilization dlc it comes out november the 16th outside of that this is havoc and i'm out of here peace